Hello, my name is Brian Carlisle, and this is my presentation on the criminalization of HIV non-disclosure in Canada. I'm a student, fourth year, at the University of the Fraser Valley in Abbotsford, for British Columbia, and this is for my Criminology 411 class. Historically, scientific advancements and discoveries have been a catalyst for many changes and revisions to the investigation of crime. Advancements such as fingerprinting and DNA have led to the exoneration of many wrongfully convicted persons, such as David Milgard, spending 12 years in jail for first-degree murder after being over, having, having his conviction overturned based on new DNA evidence. In the early 1980s, science became aware of the existence of a deadly virus that had been killing the human population since around 1910. We now know that to be the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. And we also know that it leads to AIDS, which is an incurable, deadly disease. Learning of this created incredible, incredible levels of fear among the population and prejudice. The Canadian people acted quite irrationally, and so did the governments, world and public health organizations, and the Canadian justice system. They went and criminalized all HIV positive persons who had been diagnosed with this infected, deadly infectious disease. Some of these are absurd initial reactions were internment and expatriation. Finally, the Supreme Court of Canada created guidelines in the Courier decision that stated where a sexual activity poses a significant risk of bodily harm, there is a duty on behalf of the HIV positive person to disclose their status. Where that duty exists, the failure to disclose is constituting a fraud and renders any consent given by their sexual partner to be invalid. This of course ignored many of the other type of, of infectious diseases and illnesses that were being passed back and forth with the same or even greater risk factors. In 2009, Swiss HIV experts produced the first ever consensus statement. It stated that HIV positive individuals on effective antiretroviral therapy or ARV therapy without any other sexually transmitted infections or STIs are therefore sexually non-infectious. This must be evaluated regularly by the treating physician at least every six months and the viral load must remain suppressed below 40 copies per milliliter of blood. Unlike many other viruses, the degree of risk for transmission of HIV in any situation depends on a variety of biological and social factors for both partners. However, worldwide, most HIV transmission happens due to the transfer of bodily fluids during sexual intercourse. Changes are definitely needed to Canada's criminal response. To better align it with the public policy, better align public policy with these recent scientific findings. The actual realities of the risk of the HIV infection and existing criminal responses Tend, seem to produce undue limitations on behalf of the HIV positive person's freedom of privacy. Canada must implement only the least restrictive means possible to ensure the protection of Canadians from infection of HIV while maintaining the patient's rights to privacy. The HIV virus in 1981 led to immediate frenzy, panic-stricken responses such as quarantine, criminalization, and restriction of movement of all HIV-positive persons among the general population. The Supreme Court of Canada created the career decision at that point, and the standards were set that basically stated that under the threat of serious criminal sanctions, all HIV-positive persons must disclose their status in advance of any sexual activity with their partner. In 1985, the Canadian criminal justice system 
further responded by classifying HIV non-disclosure as a contravention of Section 265, 3C, 268, and 273 of the Criminal Code of Canada, known as aggravated sexual assault. Convictions only require the Crown must show beyond reasonable doubt that the complainant's consent to sexual intercourse was vitiated by the accused fraud as to his non-disclosure of HIV status. This test had two elements. First, it required a dishonest act, either the falsehood or the failure to disclose the status. And the second, a deprivation, denying the complainant the knowledge that would they have had, they wouldn't have agreed to the sexual relations that had exposed them to the significant risk of bodily harm. But still, no requirement was made for the act of a victim actually becoming infected with HIV under criminal law. The courier, test, courier tests sorry, also had two uncertainties. Number one, what constitutes significant risk? And number two, what, co what constitutes serious bodily harm? Is it a 1% risk significant? Or is 10%? Or 51 indeed? Or 0.01, is that enough? Is this not a question best left for science and beyond the purview of prosecutors and judges? Two very recent Supreme Court of Canada decisions, also on the same issue, R versus DC and R versus maybe R, created even further guidelines in this area of HIV non-disclosure. In the first, the DR versus DC case, a female accused was charged with sexual assault and aggravated sexual assault. When she first engaged in vaginal intercourse with the complainant, she had not disclosed to him the fact that she was HIV positive. The critical issue that the trial judge saw was whether a condom had been used or not. Not very scientific. And the only evidence heard by the court was the complainant's and the defendant's own personal evidence. Absolutely no scientific or medical evidence of expertise was provided. Amazingly, the Court of Appeal set aside the convictions on the ground that even without condom use, the absence of a detectable HIV copies in the accused blood did not meet the requirement of a significant risk of serious bodily harm. In the second case, the Mabier case, the male accused was charged with nine counts of aggravated sexual assault. However, in this case, none of the complainants contracted the HIV virus. The trial judge convicted him on six of the counts, acquitting him on the other three, on the basis that the sexual intercourse using a condom, when the viral load are undetectable, does not place the sexual partner at significant risk of bodily harm, as required then by the courier decision. The Supreme Court of Canada decided that the Mabier appeal should be allowed, in part, and three convictions were restored while the appeal was dismissed on the remaining count. Scientifically, the Swiss National AIDS Commission determined that a person's risk of transmission of HIV is insignificant if, after six months of treatment, their plasma's viral load is undetectable and no other sexually transmitted infections are present. Unfortunately, the new Supreme Court of Canada guidelines that these two new decisions create seem once again to be more based on a negative social perception of the dangerousness of HIV rather than on the current scientific evidence coming from Switzerland. Swiss experts have even begun using the term non-infectious. Recommendations from these experts clearly indicate that an HIV-infected person on the active antiretroviral therapy with completely suppressed virus is not sexually infectious. Vis-a-vis, -vis, they cannot transmit HIV during sex. The Swiss Commission stated that the courts have to take this into account 
the fact that HIV positive people on ARVs and without SDIs cannot transmit HIV sexually. In the New England, in the New England Journal of Medicine article, Scientists hypothesize that antiretroviral therapy could reduce sexual transmission in the virus. Several other studies have reported decreased acquisition of the HIV-1 virus by the sexual partners of patients also receiving the antiretroviral therapy. The incongruence between the latest scientific findings and the Supreme Court of Canada findings is a clear example of Canada's continually unduly oppressive, fear-driven response to the highly stigmatized issue of HIV infection and non-disclosure. Even U.S. President Ronald Reagan waded into this area by making a public slur inferring that HIV AIDS is a form of punishment for some form of guilty victim when he stated, they should send HIV to the Libyan leader Muammar al-Qaddafi. Why is there no threshold level to an actual risk for such an aggravated and serious an offense? And should there not be one considering the gravity of this offense? Should any criminal offense of aggravated sexual assault not require the actual risk of HIV infection, not just some perceived, perceived risk? And should an offense of aggravated sexual assault exist without any victim, especially do victimless criminals deserve, after their sentence, their, their incarceration, being classified as a dangerous sexual offender for potentially the rest of their life? There is no doubt that some behaviors of those that are prosecuted under Canada's criminal law regarding HIV transmission are truly blameworthy. These individuals do not invoke much sympathy and some really deserve the punishment for which they received for the horrible things that they have done. However, policymakers, law enforcement, prosecutors, and judges must tread carefully with such a slippery slope, riddled with such scientific, ethical, and legal problems that arise from using the criminal law and the justice system without including medicine and scientific fact. Especially considering that many persons who are HIV positive do adhere to their ARV medications at all times, do not ever have any STIs uh, in addition, but in spite of the fact they must also disclose their HIV status or be criminalized to the same serious level. It is also possible that by criminalizing HIV transmission in Canada based on a patient's diagnosis might actually be causing potentially infected persons from becoming tested in the first place. Criminal sanctions even to unintentional HIV transmissions worsen the stigma associated with infection and create discouragement for voluntary patient HIV testing. Researchers believe that a possible effect from criminalizing HIV non-disclosure might be unmotivating potentially newly diagnosed HIV patients from becoming tested and diagnosed. We already know statistically that only about half of all HIV positive persons in Canada are aware of their positive status. This it's catastrophic for the patient's own personal, medical, and physical health by delaying the diagnosis and delaying their, the antiretroviral treatment. By not getting tested, from their point of view, they cannot potentially be criminally charged. So unlike usually most other criminal laws, in this instance, the ignorance of their HIV positive status is an excuse. Medical professionals, researchers, and patients would say that it is highly counterproductive, the criminalization of HIV non-disclosure, as an effective treatment to curing the epidemic. 
then for why is Canada and so many other developed nations' usage of criminal law regarding HIV non-disclosure not evolving at the same rate and with the same level as current scientific findings? Is it HIV criminalization is still a fear and stigma driven issue instead? And will Canada's refusal to follow leading scientific findings and continue to be the highest incarcerator in the world for a of HIV positive persons for alleged failure to disclose HIV, even when the risk of their actual infectiousness is scientifically non-existent or the alleged victim has not been infected, especially for such a serious an offense as aggravated sexual assault. And lastly, why is the, per is the accused person's HIV DNA marker not taken, identified, and confirmed evidentially to be the actual accused person's virus that infected the victim, like done in so many other criminal cases, such as rape, murder, in any case that is considered serious like this. Now is the time, I believe, for scientific methodology to evolve our laws and end this present I have to hate to say witch hunt against some of Canada's most vulnerable and disabled citizens. Thank you for watching.